In this lecture, we're going to look at some applications of triple integration. We'll have three applications, and each of these is analogous to what we saw for double integration. So we're not going to spend too much time on the reasoning why. I just want to look at some examples. An application we saw for double integration was area computations. So if we could describe some region in R2 as a type 1 or type 2 region, then we could double integrate 1 over that region to compute its area. Similarly here, we can compute the volume of a closed bounded region D in XYZ space if we can describe it with inequalities and set up the triple integral of 1 over D. And then I'm going to write DV for my differential. Before, for double integrals, I wrote dA. That was because when we did our Riemann sum, what we treated as the base was a little piece of area. When we do triple integration, we chop up a region in R3. So what we think of as the base going into our Riemann sum calculation is like a little piece of volume. So when I write dV, that's my shorthand for dx, dy, dz, or dz, dy, dx, whatever type of region it is. Just like before with double integration, with triple integration, we can compute the average value of a function. In this context, we're computing the average value of a scalar valued function of three variables over some domain d. So the average value is a number, which we get by integrating f over d and dividing out all of that volume by the volume of d. But using number one, we can rewrite this as a ratio of integrals. So that's the triple integral of f over d divided by the triple integral of 1 over d. And then lastly, we'll talk about how to compute the center of mass for a non-uniform three-dimensional object. The end result would be that central point where we can balance the object. So the result of that calculation would be x bar, y bar, z bar, because we're working in R3. Let's see an example of using a triple integral to compute the volume of a region in R3. So in particular, let's find the volume of the solid enclosed by the two cylinders x squared plus y squared equals r squared and y squared plus z squared equals r squared. The first cylinder is a cylinder of radius r whose central axis is the z axis. That's that cylinder I've pictured here, kind of vertical. And the other cylinder is a cylinder lying on its side its central axis is the x-axis. We can see these cylinders intersect in, say, some curves that look kind of like an x, as we can see them from here, from our angle. And they're enclosing some region whose volume we would like to compute. In order to set up the bounds of integration, I would like to switch over to a MATLAB demonstration so that we can explore this region in a little bit more detail. Here are those two cylinders, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and y squared plus z squared equals r squared. I plotted this here for r equals 1. Here are the curves of intersection. You can see how these two cylinders intersect. They intersect in like an x-shaped curve. So these are all of the xyz points which simultaneously satisfy the equations x squared plus y squared equals r squared and y squared plus z squared equals r squared. So now we can enclose our solid. Students have asked me in the past if it's a sphere. It's not a sphere. We look at the shadow that this region casts in the xy plane by looking straight down from above. It's a solid disk, and that shouldn't surprise you because our solid is enclosed in the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So we can describe x and y independently of z by describing x and y in this type 3 region. Then we need to determine for any choice of x and y coordinates chosen from that disk, how do we bound z? Well, if I take an xy coordinate from the disk, if I imagine traveling vertically up through this object, we enter the object on the lower half of the cylinder y squared plus z squared equals r squared. 
So the lower half of the cylinder satisfies the equation z equals negative square root r squared minus y squared. And then we keep traveling up and we exit the region on the top half of that cylinder. And that corresponds to the equation z equals the square root of r squared minus y squared. So that's what we'll do. We'll put dz on the inside and it will be bounded by functions of y. And then we'll have dx dy or dy dx on the outer two integrals. As we just discussed in MATLAB, the shadow this region casts on the xy plane is a solid disk of radius r. That's because this region is enclosed in the vertical cylinder. So we just look straight down and that's the disk we saw. So we can bound x between negative r and r, it's the left side of the disk to the right side of the disk, and y is going to be bounded between two functions of x, negative square root of r squared minus x squared and square root of r squared minus x squared. That takes us from the lower semicircle to the upper semicircle in the xy plane. For any choice of x and y from that disk, we can then bound z. z is actually going to be bounded between two functions of y. So as we travel up through this region, the lower bound for d is negative square root of r squared minus y squared. That's giving us the lower half of the cylinder. And then the top half is square root of r squared minus y squared. Now we have inequalities describing all three of these variables, so we can set up our volume computation. The volume is going to be the triple integral of the number one over this region. It's analogous to our area computations from double integration. So we'll say the volume is equal to the integral from negative r to r, that's the outermost bounds, those must be constant. Then the integral from the negative square root of r squared minus x squared through the square root of r squared minus x squared. And then the way we set up this problem, the innermost bounds are from negative root r squared minus y squared through root r squared minus y squared. We're integrating one, and with the bounds as written, our order is dz, dy, dx. Okay, the first computation is easy. If I wanna integrate one, from a lower bound to an upper bound, it's always the length of the interval that I integrated over. So the width of this interval for z is just top bound minus bottom bound. That leaves us with a double integral of two square root of r squared minus y squared dy dx. And now we've reached a bit of a roadblock because I don't really wanna anti-differentiate this. So let's see if there's a way around finishing the integral as it's currently written. And there is. Because our region in the xy plane was totally symmetric with respect to x and y, it was a solid disk, so it was a type 3 region. I've set it up as a type 1 region, but there's no reason why I couldn't switch to a type 2. And when we do that, y will be bounded between negative r and r and then x will be bounded between the semicircle on the left and the semicircle on the right. So if we travel through that disk left to right, we'll get our bounds for x. They will go from negative square root of r squared minus y squared through the square root of r squared minus y squared. And then our integrand stays the same. So by doing this, I'm changing the order of integration by redescribing the region that we were about to integrate over, changing the roles of which variable needs to go on the outermost integral and which one needs to go on the inner one. So this is now going to be dx dy. And I have gained something by doing this because with respect to x, the integrand is a constant. So at least the next round of integration is easy. So it's this constant times the width of the interval that we integrate over with respect to x. So fully written out, that's going to be four times the square root times the square root. We'll simplify that. And at the same time, I'd also like to acknowledge that the integrand we're left with for y is even symmetric, and we're integrating y from negative r to r. So I can write that as twice the integral from zero to r, and then simplifying the integrand that we had, that's four r squared minus four y squared dy. This is just a polynomial, so this is easy to integrate.
So by switching to a type 2 description, we greatly simplified our calculation. Now we just anti-differentiate in the usual way. I pulled the 4 out front, and we're left with 8 times r squared y minus y cubed over 3. Plug in r, subtract off plugging in 0, and you're left with the volume enclosed between these two cylinders is 16 r cubed divided by 3. Let's do an average value problem. Let's find the average value of f of x, y, and z equals x times cosine y over the domain described as x is between 0 and 1, y is between 0 and pi over 2, and z is between 0 and 3 minus 2x. So we need to integrate f over this domain. So I'll set that up as 0 to pi over 2 on the outside, that's for y, 0 through 1, that's for x, and then the innermost integral will go from 0 to 3 minus 2x. The function itself, so x times cosine of y, and then the way I've set this up, I need to order my differentials dz, dx, dy. One observation I would make at this point is that the integrand factors into a function of x times a function of y times 1, which you could view as a function of z, and then my bounds for x and z have nothing to do with y. So we can actually peel that y integral off out front and say that this is going to be the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine y dy times a double integral with respect to x and z. Now this integrand has no dependence on z. After peeling the cosine y off out front, I'm left with x dz. x is a constant, so anti-differentiating that is really fast with respect to z. It's just going to be x times the width of the integral that we integrated over. Okay, so I can anti-differentiate cosine. I get sine. We'll evaluate that at pi over 2 and subtract off evaluating it at 0. And then this is just a polynomial. It's 3x minus 2x squared, so we can anti-differentiate that. That would be 3 halves x squared minus 2 thirds x cubed. Evaluate it at 1, subtract off evaluating at 0. Then sine of pi over 2 is 1, sine of 0 is 0. And then we're left with 3 halves minus 2 thirds. So the integral of f over this domain is 5 sixths. To compute the average value, I need to divide that out by the volume of the domain. The volume of the domain, as we just discussed, is the triple integral of 1 over this domain. So what I'm going to do is peel the y integral out front like we did a second ago and then have a single integral for y times a double integral for x and z. So that's the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 1 dy times the double integral 0 to 1, 0 to 3 minus 2x, 1 dz dx. The first integral is just integrating 1 from 0 to pi over 2. That's going to give us pi over 2. That's the width of the interval that we integrated over. And then likewise, we're going to integrate 1 with respect to z. So again, that's also just going to give us back the length of the integral that we integrated over. So this simplifies to pi over 2 times now just the integral from 0 to 1 of 3 minus 2x dx. Anti-differentiate that, we get pi over 2 times 3x minus x squared, plug in 1, subtract off plugging in 0, and we actually get that the volume of this domain is pi. So overall, the average value of this function, which is just a number, is going to be the triple integral of f over the domain divided by the volume of the domain. So that's 5 sixths divided by pi, or it's 5 over 6 pi. Our last application for triple integration is to find the center of mass of a non-uniform three-dimensional object that we can describe as occupying a domain in R3. This is analogous to the plane laminas that we saw as an application of double integration, so we'll go through this pretty quickly. Once again, if the density is uniform, then mass is just density times volume. If we're looking at an object in R3 which is non-uniform, then what we do is we imagine taking that object and chopping it up into tiny little pieces. To each piece, we associate a representative density that we compute by plugging some point xi star, yj star, zk star into our density function. We say this one density 
will represent the density of this entire piece, this little piece that we just chopped off. Multiply that by the volume of the piece, add it all together, we'd have a triple Riemann sum. As we chopped up finer and finer, we would be approaching the triple integral of the density function over this domain. So sigma is density, and then dv represents the little pieces of volume that we obtained when we chopped our object up. Then we need to calculate the moments. So here, the moments are going to be calculated relative to the coordinate planes. The first one will denote m sub yz, and we get that by triple integrating the product of x times sigma over d. Why x? Because the x coordinate of any point in space measures the displacement of that point off of the yz plane. Right, if you're at the point 2, 0, 3, you are two units away from the yz plane. The moment will denote m sub xz measures displacement. Then this integral is going to detect how the mass is situated in the x direction. Similarly, the xz moment, m sub xz, is going to be the triple integral of y times sigma because y is measuring our displacement off of the xz plane. And m sub xy similarly would be the triple integral of z times sigma. Put it all together to find the center of mass, x bar, y bar, z bar. That's like the point where we could balance this object on our fingertip. It would be myz divided by m, so that's computing like an average x value our average displacement in the x direction. mxz divided by m would be for the y coordinate. And lastly, mxy divided by m gives us our average z coordinate. So this was a quick look at applications of triple integration. I hope you made the connections between the applications we saw in this lecture and the ones that we've already seen for double integration. Thank you for your attention.